Right, so in this video we're going to take a look at a couple of examples. Examples determining direction of unboundedness. And we're going to do it two ways. Graphically is one way. And then using the null space. Is a second, okay? And so um, here's the sp or here's the region we're going to work with. Minus x1 plus 2x2 is less than or equal to 6. Minus x1 plus x2 is less than or equal to 2. And x2 is bigger than or equal to 1. Okay, so if I draw this region out, let's see, the y value is going to be greater than or equal to 1, so go ahead and put that one in. And then we also have the lines um, See, this line is going to be uh, y equals x plus 2, right? If you think about it that way. Which just uh, comes up here with a slope. It starts here at 2, and then works its way up with a slope of 1. Then this line, if you solve for x2, you can see that the slope is going to be 1 half, and the intercept is 3, so it's going to come through 3, and it's going to have a slope of 1 half, so that's going to come like that. Good. And so this is the region then for, that we're uh, thinking about for our directions of unboundedness. Good. Now, uh, the idea here is that, of course, you could easily find a direction of unboundedness just by taking the direction straight out. But we want to try to give a better look to see what other directions of unboundedness there are. Um, in fact, you could use a ray with slopes um, between 0, and then you would take the minimum of the two slopes here. So you could have a ray with a slope of between 0 and a slope of 1 half. <coughs> so uh, geometrically then, the ray that we use for D could have any slope between oops, between uh, 0 and 1 half. Right, if you get any bigger than 1 half then uh, it's not going to be a direction of unboundedness anymore because it would jump out of this region up at the top here. Okay, good. All right, so that's how we do how we would do this geometrically. By the way, <clears throat> maybe I'll stop here for a second and say, um, how would I find the full vector d uh, using this? Because remember that the vector d is not in R two. Uh, our direction of unboundedness is not in R two. Um, because that's our set here, the matrix is not in standard form, right? And so what is the matrix here? Um, whoops. Sorry about that. My thumb hit, a, hit the wrong button there. So my matrix A is going to be uh, minus 1, 2, 1, 0. Let's see, what am I going to need? I'm going to need an E1 too, right? Good. So that takes care of my first constraint. My second constraint is minus 1, 1, and then I'm going to need another slack variable, right? And then for the third, I'm going to have uh, 0, 1, but then I'm going to need an excess variable. Good. So this is my matrix A now. Oops, by the way, the excess variable has a negative sign. And so my matrix, or my vector D should be an R5, right? because it's the number of free variables here. So <clears throat> you might keep in mind right what these equations represent. So right off to the side, I, sh I guess I could have written this out a different way because I'm just going to be writing out uh, the same thing I would have started with, right? That's That represents this equation. And then this one is going to have the S2, and then this one is going to have x2 minus e1, 
And then on this side, I'll just have the equals 6 equals 2 and equals 1, right? Good. All right. The reason I'm keeping these in mind is because, remember, we said that the vector could look like this. In this case, our our miniature version of D and R2 would be the vector um, 1, 0, right? Well, <coughs> if x1 equals 1 and x2 equals 0, can we find the other uh, three values? Well, you just plug them in, right? And so, um, let's see, <coughs> where are we at here? Oops, let me pause for a second. Okay, so uh, I should really put uh, a different thing here because if this is my matrix A, then we want to remember that A times D must be equal to zero. And so it can't be equal to 6, 2, 1. <laughs> it has to be 0, 0, 0. Right? And so when you're looking for your direction of unboundedness, we want to remember that that must be true. Okay, so then uh, let's plug things in. Um, we're going to be solving for S1, S2, and E1. So S1 is going to be uh, X1 minus 2X2. So in this case, we're just going to have 1 minus 0, which is 1. And then E1, or sorry, S2 is coming next, is going to be X1 minus X2, and that's equal to 1 minus 0 equals 1. E1 is the last one, um, so E1 is going to be X2, which is 0. Good. So we have 1, 1, 0 there. And so now we have the full vector D is going to be 1, 0, 1, 1, 0. Good. That's an R5. <coughs> Very good. Now, what does a vector D look like with slope of exactly one half? It might be one half. Well, in that case, uh, D would be something like uh, 2, 1, right? That would have a slope of 1. So I'm going to put this in quotes, right? Because our full D is an R5. Okay, so then using our uh, equations here, we can also write, we can find the other variables. So that means that S1 would have to be uh, 2 minus 2 times 1, right, which is 0. S2 would be uh, 2 minus 1, which is 1. E1 would be X2, which is 1. And there we go. And so now my vector D is going to be 2, 1. 0, 1, 1. Good. All right. And finally, um, you know, the general form we were looking for is through the null space of the matrix A. And so, um, just for fun, we could take a look for the, uh, take a look at the um, null space of this matrix. So let me rewrite the matrix down here. I'll pause and we'll be right back. Okay, so we're back again. And so I've just rewritten the matrix A here. That was coming from uh, the system up here. And I also went ahead and uh, wrote down the row reduced echelon form of A. And so from this, we can write down a basis, or we can get a basis for our null space, right? Uh, remember, x1 or, and x2 are the variables. S1, uh, I guess we had S2 and then E1, right? So then from this we see that x1 is equal to s2 plus e1. x2 is a basic variable, let's e1. <coughs> s1 is basic, and um, so it's going to be s2 minus e1. And then uh, s2 is free or non-basic, and then e1 is free or non-basic. Good. And so this set right here is S2 times one vector plus E1 times another vector, right? 
So that would be 1, 0, 1, 1, 0, and 1, 1, negative 1, 0, 1. Good. All right. Now, uh, I want to interpret this. So I'm looking for uh, some basic direction of unboundedness. And so um, I want, there's two conditions that we have to satisfy. Uh, one is that a times d is equal to zero. And the second one is that d is greater than or equal to zero. Okay, and so you can take any linear combination of these two as long as this is satisfied, because this is automatically satisfied now. Uh, any linear combination here is going to be in the null space. So all we need to do is find some linear combinations that are positive. And so for example, uh, if S2 is equal to 0 and E1 is equal to... Oops, I don't want it that way. How about 1 and 0? There you go. <clears throat> then the direction of unboundedness would be uh, just the one in behind uh, S2 there. And similarly, I could add, sum these two vectors together. If I take S2 equal to 1 and E1 equal to 1, whoops, what happens? I get D, by the way, this is 1, 0, doesn't, isn't it? The D in this case is 2, 1, 0, oops, 0, 1. And I think that one was already found before too. Yes, it was right there. Two one zero one one two one zero. Oops, one one. <laughs> I've only got four numbers here. What am I doing? There we go. Okay. And then the one zero one one zero was also found. Good. So you could take any linear combination as long as d is greater than zero. So that is an example of uh, determining the direction of unboundedness two ways. One way is to just look and see in the graph what's happening, but you have to be careful with that because the direction or the vector d that we're talking about uh, is actually in R5, not in R2. And so we have to adjust the equations a bit using our second um, piece of information, and that was that a times d must be 0 and d must be greater than or equal to 0. Good. See you in the next video.